Okay. There you go. All right. So this is episode zero of the unnamed, soon to be named podcast. I can't say unnamed podcast because I bet there's a podcast named unnamed podcast. There probably is. <laughs> Um, and so this is just us getting together, trying to figure out if we're aligned on a potential podcast idea, throw out some ideas and test to see if we can even um, find good topics. Although Steve just told me that there's always good topics. So that's helpful, um, which is probably true. Uh, I thought maybe actually, and so I don't think, I mean, Tim has met Steve. Tim and I were both on Steve's podcast. But Adriel doesn't know anyone except for me. So maybe just a round of introductions. Um, Have I seen I Adriel on previous uh, podcast recordings that you sent to the Canonical Date Lab? Uh, I, yeah, he, he and I met through Game B. So we do, we actually do a weekly thing. So I probably have shared one of them, or not a weekly. We used to do a weekly thing. Now it's a monthly kind of build in public. Um, and Steve, I don't know if you're familiar with Game B at all. Do you know what that is? No, not at all. No. Um, so, I'll, yeah. So, uh, although there might be some viewers, I guess the viewers will probably know me, but in case y'all share these out, um, Bentley Davis, uh, software programmer for 30 years, did some startups, and now I'm trying to improve the world through helping us uh, manage the onslaught of information better. Um, and uh, I just thought it'd be nice to have a podcast where I can promote my own stuff and ideas, <laughs> but uh, the ostensibly is to come together and kind of talk through an, an interaction and give different examples of how people can make that interaction more valuable, more useful. Um, so that's kind of the idea. Um, yeah, and I guess uh, just, to, just to kind of mention, Adrian, I met on Game B, and that's a, it's a, a group, uh, a loose group of people that are trying to make the world a better place, theorizing that game A is the world we're in today and game B is the world that they're going to, or that they're hoping to be there, but they have no idea what it looks like and there is no central authority and all that jazz. So, and when I say I'm a member, that's very loose because there's no membership and I don't ascribe to probably half of it, so. <laughs> But don't hold it against me if you've had bad experience. With um, maybe that's a good lead into Adriel. All right, thanks, Bentley. Uh, so as Bentley said, we met in Game B. Um, do a formerly weekly, now monthly. Uh, it's meant to be a board meeting with uh, Bentley, myself, and my sister, who's actually the one that got me into Game B and uh, sort of the one that introduced us. Um, my background is I have a history in product management. Um, so I've coded maybe one hour in my life and decided that was not for me, um, but have been in the software world for a while now and uh, done, you know, w w w worn a fair number of hats, but found myself drawn to, to, to product management. Um, the thing that sort of got me into Game B was a project called Wikilection, which started out trying to be a... Um, like IMDB for politics was sort of the, the goal. And uh, that has since ballooned into something a lot b b bigger of a beast than was originally planned because I thought that sort of a, lo a, a lot of the issues surrounding misinformation were connected. Um, and now it's part of a parent project called Conferati, which uh, I'm working to try and explain the whole thing, which is proving challenging, um, but yeah, that's, I guess, how mine and, and Bentley's projects are actually fairly similar as far as they're both sort of trying to help solve the information problem and help p people agree on information. I'm not sure what else we, we, we want to cover on these intros, but I'll let yeah. somebody else. No, that's, I think that's good. I should probably mention my current, the project, my project is currently named Gullibot. So that's the, it's a bot that gullible and guides people through a more effective conversation, if it works. <laughs> um, Tim, you wanna take the next one? Sure, um, Tim Hai, uh, co-founder of the Canonical Debate Lab, but I'm also a software engineer, like my whole life, pretty much. Um, but yeah, so uh, my hope, my belief is that someday uh, misinformation can be largely resolved 
Um, if you just build the right thing and people use it, it may be naive, but I, I uh, build it and they will come, right? That, that always works. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the, they will come. I don't, I'm not that naive, but I build it. And if they actually use it, it, it would solve a lot of the problems. I think, I, I believe. Um, I also though, um, personally, I'm interested in ways of better communicating with people, certainly better ways of arguing and debating with people, because I think there are a lot of good ways to do it without ruffling feathers and actually getting somewhere. So yeah, that's my interest in being here. That's Steve. Okay, I'm Steve Villano. Uh, I'm an Associate Professor of Rhetoric at uh, St. John's University in New York City. Um, I, for about 20 years, I've taught um, rhetoric, which is public speaking, argumentation, debate, uh, oral expression, I guess, if you want to go big tent. Um, I'm interested in all kinds of, um, all kinds of things uh, in terms of teaching people how to argue better, debate better. Um, let's see, I just recently discovered Substack, so I guess that's the thing I'm spending the most attention on, so sophisticsteam.substack.com. I'm playing with it. I mean, I've got, I had a pretty nice start to the list, but then I get today that 20% people have clicked on unsubscribe. So I need to change it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like I, that audience feedback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. There's pretty high unsubscribe rate. So that's not, I don't know. That's as normal, but, but yeah, it takes okay. some experimenting. Yeah. I'm just treating it like a blog, but maybe that's the wrong tack, but we'll see. I just got into it. So I'm like two weeks old. So awesome. Well, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, uh, I so I threw out a, a simple agenda um, of um, uh, so I guess the first thought was kind of to review kind of the brainstorming document. I guess I could pull that up while we're talking. Um, I assume everyone's kind of taken a moment to look at it, and if not, look at it. You could just lie and say you did. Um, and uh, it did, so, and, and we got some comments back and forth on it. Um, does anyone have anything they want to talk through on that that we couldn't really express easily on the chat or any questions or changes? Or does everyone say it's perfect and I'm just awesome? I think we, we should just pick a topic and, and start from there. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's probably a good place to start anyways. Um, so, and I, I was looking for topics this morning and uh, Tim and I have a couple topics uh, that are a little bit older, um, but does anyone have any, any that they think is just, you know, rare and to go and, and would be an ideal topic? I'm curious to see what you guys think might be good, just to get kind of a sense of the flavor of the direction you wanted to go. Yeah, so we were, so it was interesting because I was going, well, maybe we should go, I, let me start with play on more sides, on the better side. So um, one of the things that we have is, um, I lost it. So, um, like the Dark Horse podcast was talking about Joe Rogan on his podcast, um, and they were talking about um, COVID vaccine, or Joe Rogan had said, you know, the advice he'd give to someone who's young, uh, uh, should they get the vaccine, he would say no. Now, he wasn't making any specific claims in there, but then the Dark Horse podcast, which is Brett and Heather Weinstein, um, talked through that in a little bit more in depth. Um, so that's kind of people that are in. Well, I would say, yeah. So. Yeah, if, as, as a meta concept, you know, for, for this idea here. Mm -hmm. um, like one of the concepts would be to take a public debate that seems to be kind of trending that, that people might be interested in and break it down in terms of how we see it, right? In terms of um, both the substance of the arguments that were made, 
but also how they were made, you know, who, who made them. Like, it would be interesting to have kind of a scoring of how well people did, um, you know, not, not a totally objective scoring, it's just kind of our opinions, but as a way to reflect on how that discussion went. Um, so, yeah, you know, if, if we were to dive into this topic, I actually, um, for the canonical debate lab work, um, I thought this might be a good way to kind of promote argument mapping and what we're trying to do with the canonical debate. Um, because you, you, essentially, if you can take, maybe it's just a, a YouTube video that got popular, some thought leader that said something. In, in this specific case that Bentley's talking about, there was a back and forth. It was like Joe Rogan said something, and then the Dark Horse podcast broke it down. And then the, another podcast called the, uh, the what is it, um, SIO, it's a- uh, uh, Serious inquiries only? Serious inquiries only, yeah. Essentially did a, re a point by point rebuttal to the Dark Horse take on it um, and, and critique on that. So it's, it, it, it's, um, it's sort of a long form way to do argument mapping that they did, which I found was interesting. So I tried to map that. I thought it would be interesting to map it out in one of our tools and then post it in the comments so people could see it and go there and ideally get, get in there and interact on those. Um, that was a lot of work. So <laughs> just, just one, one example was a little too much work. It took me three weeks of whatever spare time I could muster before I kind of gave up. But, um, you know, we could do that sort of thing here live in a podcast in an hour. and It would be quicker, I think. And maybe even just taking one of the points, because the, in their back and forth, they're usually arguing, you know, a set of points and just take one of the points that they back and forth on rather than the whole thing is up. Yeah, we could each kind of, if we had time to prepare it, we could each listen and pick our own favorite. Um, like I have my favorite, which would be the, the uh, there, was, there was a part where in the, the Dark Horse hosts essentially went to some extent to undermine the public comments of some other person at the, uh, I can't remember the, the Institute. Was it Wall Street um, Journal and New York Times or? No, no, it was a uh, newspaper. It was a medical institute. Um, no, no, I think this person was at a, uh, uh, at, an academic at a university. Um, I, I can pull up if you want, like the different parts of the argument, because um, I actually did that mapping. But, but it was interesting because essentially somebody who is doing a postdoc, I think, in uh, um, misinformation, something around misinformation, basically, mm -hmm. um, made the point that there was a problem with Joe Rogan's statement, um, which is, he, he essentially said, yeah, in my opinion, I wouldn't get the vaccine if I were a healthy 21 year old. Um, and not, not, not undermining that statement, just saying um, it's dangerous, somebody with that big a reach because Joe Rogan has, has the biggest, um, most uh, watched YouTube or podcast out there. Yeah, he has a bigger reach than most TV shows basically. Um, to make an offhanded statement like that may be innocent because it's only his opinion, but does a lot of harm it was essentially the point of this postdoc. And, and the Dark Horse, um, I, I forget the name of the, the, the woman on there, the, the wife, Heather, I think, I can't remember her name. Um, yeah, Heather. so she went to some extent to essentially undermine the authority of the person that made that statement. Um, and I found it to be um, to some extent, a, a bit of, uh, it, this is a hard one to break down because essentially the person arguing is arguing from a point of authority. So they're, they're doing an appeal to authority and then undermining an appeal to authority um, is to some extent what we might call poisoning the well or something because sure you're undermining that one person's concept uh, their their ability or their right to say that thing but you're not really attacking the point of what they were saying um, and then the third aspect of that was that the person undermining that person's authority was themselves not an authority on the subject which they were undermining so it's a it's a um 
I found that to be an interesting uh, thing to explore. And, and also I found that Heather's efforts to determine whether or not that person was an authority on the matter was very superficial, uh, which was also disappointing. So that to me was, was why I would pick that moment in, the, in the, uh, their, their presentation. Yeah, uh, yeah, for me, it brings up, I think we got two episodes right there. So the first episode would be something like, what's the difference? What counts as information and what counts as misinformation? This is a, a very, very old topic. So we can, we can take it back old school, old, old school, old to the fifth power school, whatever you want to do. And then the other one is like, what's the difference between an influencer and an expert, which I think would complicate those fallacies in a very productive way for the audience. But I just wonder, I mean, this is, all sounds great to me, but I'm wondering uh, if there's a vision of who the audience for this might be, or, or who do we want to reach, and where where in life are these people? And because it strikes me as a couple of things, like younger people who are really into political argument might like the, the show. If we take popular podcasts and kind of say, how could they have done it better? Like, you know, we're kind of like the Sports Center or something. Like, let's 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 break down that pass. You know, like they do on on the NFL Monday shows, yeah, yeah. literally Monday morning quarterbacking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but then there's also this like other market of people who are maybe mid-career and they're kind of having some regrets about not maybe paying attention to some of their humanities work in college and they kind of miss that. And they kind of want to get back into that space of like the philosophy and the speculation. And the, you know, this is like the audience of like the great courses audience. Um, you know, like they sell all those CD courses in like airplane catalogs and stuff. I mean, I don't, they're not watching, I don't want to consult them, but they, they reach this kind of mid-career audience. It's like, and I really do want to learn more, a little bit more about this philosopher and this kind of thing. So it could be that we have a mix of shows like that we do the sports zone. Like, Here is this debate on Joe Rogan. Let's break it down for you. And then do some more speculative ones like, when we say information, what do we mean? How do we communicate that? How do we know we've encountered misinformation or just a preference, which I think is a pretty legitimate question. I would add there's a third audience um, that, that doesn't match this um, specific discussion one bit, but might be interesting to also at least tackle sometimes. It, it, that's bad to market to two different audiences. So maybe it's like two separate channels, but another one is um, looking at it from, um, the interrelational aspect of just talking to people. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't the right topic for that one. Um, but there are times I would like to talk about that. Um, I think it would be bad to, or confusing maybe to the audience. We'd have to see how that goes. But, um, you know, I, I definitely agree for the, the topic that we just discussed. Uh, almost, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know if we could do a really good job of aiming it at the uh, great courses audience. Um, I, I think that's a harder one because I think that kind of audience probably is more interested in um, more planned, edited, digested content that is, is more to the point. Could be wrong about that. If we do it in a, in a way that's entertaining and, and manage to add something every episode, then that would be good. Um, otherwise, it's going to be hard to do that one right. Um, obviously, then the quarterbacking approach um, certainly has a lot more of an entertainment aspect to it. Um, so yeah, the, uh, and uh, Tim had mentioned that you know going after two audiences is not generally is considered a bad uh, tactic. Um, although the, really, what the thing is that you you focus on one audience and you know other other people outside of that will will hopefully come. Um, so the target is just so that you're focused. And I do think probably the, the easiest target and the target that also fits, I think several of our projects really ends up being, I hate to use the term activist because that's negative in some groups, but people who are passionate about what's going on around them. So they're active in politics. They're active in, in other things that, that, that I don't know fit in politics, but like nutrition and stuff like that, that other things that people are arguing where they do want to have an impact on other people. Um, so I kind of see that as an audience of my, that's definitely the audience of my other project. 
Um, so I kind of think that would be the target here. Um, in that case, like I, I see that kind of person as being like, please, um, what, what they want is please give me the tools so I can go use this. You know, essentially give me the weapons that I can <laughs> use for my own personal fights, right? Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. And so that's what they want. And then what we would give them instead is some weapons. But my thought is to, I mean, we might point out the more the weapons that can be used, whether you're on the right side of the argument or not, and we can discuss what right means. Um, uh, but helping them focus on, on actually having a positive impact on the world rather than just their immediate goals. So I do want to kind of attract them. And that's why I thought some of the, the, the names that we were bouncing around, like winning arguments or mind changers or stuff like that, even though to a lot of people that I work with, those are antithetical and actually violent words. And I'm like, well, you know, you use sometimes you use a violent title to attract people and then you turn them, <laughs> you know, to nonviolent ways um, to, you know, to to speak to people that aren't the audience that you want to persuade isn't isn't helping anyone. Uh, but yeah, I would think that that, that might be our, our main target. Um, like when when you have an audience that's that's looking for tools, um, they definitely want um, you to feed their confirmation bias. Um, you know, and I, I, I feel that myself. They're like my one of my favorite um, podcasts is opening arguments, and um, it, they do a great job of taking a single side, more or less politically, but boiling it down into um, very um, clean, uh, realistic, not exaggerated points. It's based on law as well. So it's obviously going to be more grounded than, than a lot of political discussions. But um, if, if we want to be more even handed about that, we might find it harder to get an audience because we're not going to be feeding confirmation bias. On the other hand, like it would be a great value, I think, or I would enjoy doing it um, and hearing something like that. Any complicated case, if you really could just boil it down to these are really the two points of contention, right? That's it. This is everything else is smoke, <laughs> um, and this is the point of contention. This is why it's actually a point of contention. Yeah, I agree. It, it definitely could be hard to kind of walk that line. Although it'd, it'd be helpful if, if you know we're talking about this being a panel show, to it maybe eventually. I I think we're most of us are kind of aligned on some political spectrum <laughs> side. Uh, it'd be nice if we could get a more diverse group. And I think if then there's kind of the meta argument about the actual facts of the case, but that would also make it much deeper that they will be seeing things that I know, especially for me doing something, you know, live and not having time to reflect. Um, that's when your biases tend to come out more. So having someone who has the opposite bias would make it a lot better. And I think almost everyone actually, if if the biases are, yeah, so instead of being even handed to having two opposing hands, I think people tend to enjoy watching Well, because one side is is feeding into their bias, even if the other isn't. This, this sounds like, or like an idea that's coming to me now is an interesting angle on, on something like this. And this might, feed into a title for the podcast so that became the focus would be essentially every episode is an exercise in steel manning right mm -hmm. um let's let's try to boil it down to the best case possible for you know even if we had opposite sides and you had to boil it down for the other side steel man the other side as best you can right um it might be interesting yeah i mean this is all i teach so that's very familiar and comfortable for me in the place yeah, I hadn't heard that phrase before, steel manning. I like that. Yeah, that's why it probably wouldn't make a great title because no one would know it. But, but yeah, something... a lot of people use it a lot these days, or at least yeah. you know, the, the podcast. It's, internet. it's, it's, it's inter internet lingo, but no, no argumentation scholar would know what you meant. That's the funny thing. Like on the internet, yeah. argument is a whole different thing. But 
I, I could go ask my colleagues and they'd be like, oh, I never heard that before. What is that? Hmm. It's that the right? opposite of straw manning, right? Straw yeah. person, right. yeah. Nowadays, you yeah, say now straw person. person. Dog. I was, I was <laughs> gonna mention that it's like you know it, yeah. I only hear uh, steel manning I've never heard steel personing um, yeah. which is interesting because even you know I, I listen to a lot of left-leaning podcasts you expect mm -hmm. they would be more careful about that and they, they don't, don't bother now, the fallacies uh, are sacred you know, so we're yeah. messing around with the holy <laughs> is that, the holy yeah. text yeah. you know but I have heard people go non-anthropocentric and say straw dogging too you shouldn't even I like straw dog. It reminds me of Socrates. He's always like swearing on the dog or whatever. If you read those old dialogues, it's like, by the dog, you're right. And this kind of stuff. So that's my bias. Yeah. 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 And um, just a straw argument or a steel argument. Um, of course, if you say stealing an argument, that sounds that has two different, completely opposite meanings. So that doesn't help. But yeah, yeah, strengthening arguments and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I, I like that as, the format strengthening both sides of the argument, regardless of, of where we stand on it. Um, yeah. I think this whole idea that Tim brought up of like boiling it down to the essentials is what we would call clash in formal sort of debate analysis, like finding the clash, which is mm. what's the actual, there might be several la la layers of disagreement. So a topic is set. And when you look at that topic, you see, you're like, oh, it's about this. And then the audience comes, and then when you're interpolated as an audience, you get another layer of what is this debate about or what is this argument about? And if you're a participant, you're like, well, how can I win this? How can I win my side? And so then you start to think of it in terms of that, which is your, your confirmation bias stuff, which is very helpful for argument and intervention. And then you would have um, the actual speaking change too. So you have all these different layers of it. So in class, you look for like, what's the point of disagreement that's most central to deciding on this motion. So we get a begged question there. So most of these debates, Joe Rogan, whatever, one of the most interesting things or helpful things I think we can do for the audience in the show is to say, what's the motion here? What is it that's being debated? And you can kind of reverse engineer that and say, what's well, one of these maybe two possibilities? So how do these arguments work in terms of like trying to say, would you support the motion or not? And, uh, yeah. uh, you know, motion construction is one of these things like, you know, students will come to you and say, well, I want to have a class debate about this. So, okay, can we make that into a motion that you could agree or disagree with after hearing some reasons? Not absolutely true or absolutely false, but could you agree? I mean, an important part of argument, I think, is that it's never conclusive. You make a decision and you roll with it, but it can always, it's always tabled. You can always reconsider if yeah. new information comes out. So this kind of like scorched earth strategy on Twitter is something, something we should probably be opposed to. Um, but it certainly does make for some tweets that make you feel great. Mm -hmm. Oh man, owned, oh, you know, that's not very healthy argument. Yeah, yeah, and also all the, the different motives. I mean, it's hard to read into motives, but you can, you know, talk about the potential motives for saying it that way. Like in some cases, a lot of times people are focusing on a specific item that would be more of a motion, but their, their desire is that you don't blindly trust this, this type of authority, right? Whether it's scientists or something like that. And, that, and yeah. that's a very charitable way to say it. Um, although I don't yeah, want to go too far into that, yeah. but, under, but understanding that, and also, like when we talk about what's the best way to kind of win this argument or or motivate other people or to get to the truth, the question is, what are you, what are you actually looking for? Because in some people, uh, you know, they they most likely have two different goals on both sides of this argument, um, and oftentimes that's why people won't concede a point, not because it works in this case, but because it doesn't work in other cases that are in their mind um yeah so th that would be a fascinating thing. and that's also why i think we could probably only do one like back and forth on a sp single topic because you can go so deep and i do want this to go deeper um you know because so many of the pod yeah, the like debate podcasts or other things you do and they're like let's talk about climate change and i'm like how many decades do you have to dedicate to this podcast <laughs> Um, right. There's, so, um, yeah. Going deep rather than going wide. 
I'm trying to trying to imagine, you know, how this could be done and be, you know, entertaining and useful. Um, so there's there's that one of, you know, what is the motion is is interesting. It's you know, what are, what are they actually saying here? Um, if we could take especially, you know, very obtuse or very indirect statements, right? Um, and try to break that down into what what are what are they actually saying here? There was right after, you know, I, I think uh, Joe Rogan came back with a uh, sort of an apology on, on his next, or, or a couple of days later, he came back with a bit of a, an apology clarification sort of thing. Um, and as he was saying that, you know, he was just in a, in a casual conversation with his, his other guest on there. And, and they were like, well, you know, did you get uh, the vaccine and the and and the guy was like embarrassed. It's all I I did. I'm a sheeple. I did. You know. And it's like mm, you know. Let's 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 break that down of what what what's going through his mind and what he's trying to say with that, which is interesting. It's like um, yeah. There's there's a lot to analyze in that that one little exchange there. Um, uh, but also another segment idea that 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 I was reminded of. Um, I think when you're talking about owning people, Steve, um, is something, so this is also something I've been wanting to do in my, my coding projects and everything. I want to build something that does this, but it, it's essentially, you know, what is the best comeback? Find the best comeback. It, essentially, I, I don't know if anybody uh, listens to, I, I guess, Reply All um, back, back when it was fun. <laughs> Reply all. I, say, I haven't uh, listened in a while, but yeah. Oh yeah, no, they just they just took some several wrong turns, but we won't go into that. Um, but they had this segment which was uh, yes, yes, no, um, mm -hmm. where they would take um, something totally a tweet that makes no sense to the casual observer, and it, the yes, yes, no was like host one, do you know what this means? Yes. Host two, do you know what this means? Yes. And uh, Alex, their 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 yeah, boss the, and guest, you know, do you know understand this tweet? No. <laughs> and then they would try to go through every little thing, implication and history of, of what was said in that tweet to boil it down for him until he finally understood. Um, that was always entertaining. Um, on a debate argumentation political side, picking, uh, you know, because most political tweets are real, they're full of innuendo and full of uh, context, implied context, and so on. And it's like, you know, pick one of those tweets, figure out exactly what they're trying to say with that. And then, you know, what would be the best comeback to that? And the best comeback would have different categories, right? The best informational come comeback, you know, the best humor comeback, you know, <laughs> the one that, that most owns them, you know, that sort of thing. Um, would be an interesting way to kind of attack something like that and then what would be the most effective if you are if you disagree with it um and then we can that would be the owning yeah own, well, own them yeah <laughs> i think i when i yeah, hear owned, in I, yeah. I feel owning is more like sick burn rather than yeah okay 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 yeah, yeah even but, if you don't convert yeah. them the most um yeah yeah, you never can, you never convert them. It's it rallies the troops. It's epideictic, it's ceremonial, celebratory rhetoric rather than deliberative, like mind changing, or, or or forensic, like judging rhetoric. So the epideictic rhetoric is always plumbing the well of what we all stand for together. So it's a good way to get a cheer from your side, but hardly ever. Hardly you know, ever persuasive. I was just out for a run and reflecting on that, <laughs> as one does. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, I should, uh, and I, I was take up running, man. I need to. Bring <laughs> yeah, or right, taking a shower sometimes uh, leads to those reflections. But um, I was specifically uh, running, wearing a mask, and um, like thinking about the people who run and don't wear a mask, or you know, how, how do you how do you deal with people you see who don't aren't wearing a mask when you you feel they should, right? Um. And I was specifically reflecting on the use of humor for that sort of thing. And the interesting part of that is, you know, online or whatever, yeah, you're talking to your own people, rallying the troops, but actually, especially when 
you're, you're creating, there's a new set of norms is being created, right? So it's not set in stone. Um, first of all, there's a lot more opportunity to influence minds. Um, but I saw a lot of humor about, you know, people that would wear it down under their nose. Uh, a lot of funny ways of like, oh, uh, I, I can't even remember them now, but it was like, yeah, oh, I guess you don't breathe out of your nose. Is that, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but funny ones, uh, if you make the right joke that in a funny way shames the people who do that, you're directing it in a, in a general sense. You're not attacking a single person. So there's nobody getting defensive. It's more like people watching that, oh, that's pretty funny and oops, I do that. You know, and they don't have to admit it to anyone and they can actually start changing their norms by remembering uh, the joke you know, and, and changing their behavior. So sometimes that kind of making fun of somebody can actually have a positive effect. Yeah, I think it, I think it can. Um, and there's, uh, so yeah, there's kind of like the sick burn and then the most effective at bringing everyone to your side. And, and, and those type of things are often very much improved by a sense of humor or by a, a wittiness to them or a succinctness of creating an idea. So yeah, exploring that. But I do like the idea of having different segments like this is just the sick burn. <laughs> And we're going to say it because it's fun to yep. talk about, but we don't recommend actually typing this into Twitter. Um, no, I, even I think, though you will get more followers should. that way. <laughs> I mean, it depends on what the goal is. Like, I mean, my response to, to Timothy is like, um, yeah, if you have an audience, um, it's not going to work that way. But if you're one on one jogging, you see somebody and you make kind of a joke about it, they'll probably be a lot less. There's the audience is them. It's just you two on the street. So it might work. So. Strong maybe, right, is pretty much what I say on all these things because it just depends on the audience. So Steve's never, never gonna actually give us a score on anything. He's gonna. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll score it, but I can score it like you know we can go into six dimensional chess here, you know, because uh, it's it becomes very quickly this kind of analysis becomes counterfactual mm -hmm. because if you're allowed to substitute whatever audience you like, you run into this kind of thing of like. Well, all these arguments at the end of that analysis are going to be good. Yeah. And, and you know what I mean, and they're yeah. all going to be bad at the same time. So you run into kind of this no place. Well, so I, there, yeah. there are theoretical tools that we've developed over the, over the years to counteract that. And I can kind of, I can provide some guidance on some of those as maybe guides to, to how to think about it. There's a couple of tools I really like, but you know, it's like too long for this meeting, but. Things and I think that would be really good to have that in the, the thing. So talk about the different audiences and how those different things would do that. Um, Cause like one of the tactics that I want to um, promote, although it definitely could be wrong is that you really should be targeting to change the mind of the person furthest from you. Now you, from your opinion on that scale and you probably will never change their mind, but I kind of have a feeling that when we aim for the easier ground or even worse preaching to the choir is that you're actually causing division because you, you are bringing some people that would have not agreed with you over, but you're pushing some people, a large group of people even harder against you and more and more stronger against your opinion. And so the, the net like societal result is negative. So that's one of my theories. Um, but yeah, yeah, having having that discussion of, you know, here, here's, here's the topic, here, like, you know, here's their response. Here's the audience we think we're presuming that they were targeting and, and why that did work for them. But if, but if they wanted to hit these other audience or did these other audience, then we could have our, our own internal discussion on what, who we think the audience should have been. Maybe they were hitting too close to home and preaching to the choir. Um, and so that you know had a certain amount of benefit, but did that have a net um, loss to their goals? Yeah. Yeah, I shared this picture that's related to the mask thing that Tim was talking about but yeah Bentley I think you're I think you're right like if we make that the state that's a very particular standard so one of the things is like when you're arguing like have a goal like what's the goal I like this I took this on the subway this is the MTAs 
approach to trying to persuade people. And this is interesting from a rhetorician's point of view because it has visual elements, it has textual elements. It doesn't have any evidence. It doesn't have any, it has a lot of proof, but it doesn't have any evidence as we would think of good evidence today. And it's uh, very highly ideological. And it also has a little bit of humor in there technically. You might say it's kind of like making fun of, of people like that. But it's also kind of showing that maybe they're, they're not doing it right. And then the big emotional appeal. Uh, but um, this yeah. is one of the MTA's attempts um, for the mask wearing on the subway. Um, but yeah, if you say my goal is to aim for the people who are the most, the least likely to be persuaded, um, the people in the middle might say, I don't think like that. This isn't for me. So you get that yeah. into that problem as well. The, the theory that we, that, well, we, my view, is there's this theory called the universal audience theory. It's pretty poorly named. But the idea is like, imagine that if reasonable people come across what you said, they would find ways to agree with it. Now, whether they want to agree with it or not is a different thing. That's where you come in with your with your choices. But you would you would expect that if somebody came upon your argument, they would be hard pressed to find reasons for that argument to be dismissed straight away. It would be because one of the one of the definitions of argument in the field is arguments a reason giving activity. Mm -hmm. Which is very different than the way a lot of people think about it. If you think about that definition, it's reason giving activity instead of I'm writing wrongs and finding the truth, all these kind of pop theories, we, we don't we don't really subscribe to those. Maybe in philosophy they do, but not in not in rhetoric. So reason giving activity. Or like um, in the Dutch argumentation theory, the, in the University of Amsterdam, they say that um, argument is to resolve a difference of opinion. And that's much more towards what Bentley's saying about these people who are opposed to you, but then you also have to have them willing to have the conversation. So there's a lot of moving parts. But I think it would be fun for our for our show to say uh, the, maybe the three audience test or something like that, and just kind of come up with it just normatively, mm -hmm. propose it, and say here are the three situations you might be most likely to. Now, reconstructing this argument, what would be most effective? What would be best here? And yeah. what about this audience? What would we say? How would we yeah. structure it? And that that might be kind of fun because it's like. Um, in a sense, it's kind of like making me think about chess end games. It's like, well, that's an unconventional move, but it worked. Should you do that every time? No. <laughs> this kind of sounds like that. But yeah, and that kind of reminds me of something. I think it was you, Steve, that said earlier about sort of approaching it like, you know, a sports show, where right yeah. there's the, the the two teams, and you're trying to break it down and say, okay, well, here's sort of the certain event, here's where we think that, that they could have gone, and kind of do the play-by-play -play of you, you You aren't saying, you know, I want a certain team to win or not, but you're just talking about sort of the specifics of that sport and of, you know, that that instance and saying, here's how we think it it, it could play out and doing that, the play-by-play -play of, okay, so here's what, 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 what we think all the options are, here's the way they, you know, here's the actual option they chose and then here's where that goes right so like here's what joe rogan said here's how people could have reacted here's a few people that did and then here's how each of those played out and sort of and then you sort of start from the one core thing branch out a couple of times and then start to, to talk about that kind of under like a you know a sporting umbrella where you're you're talking it about a fairly hopefully impartial i think in i mean i'm, I'm not much of a sports person but I think that like some of the people on those shows are actually impartial and some of them blatantly are not. But as long as they can still approach it through that like kind of impartiality where, you know, you can say like, oh, I don't even like that team. But yeah, this play here was still good. And I can see why that worked. Or like, oh, that was a really smart play. I'm mad that 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 made them win. But I see why it did. Yeah, I like the I like the idea of. Um of yeah having it be like a sports review show yeah like one of the I'll often, <laughs> yeah i'll often do this There's... with uh beginning students i literally will draw a soccer pitch on the on the whiteboard and then i draw and i'm like okay so what's the what is the ground we actually call it ground hmm. so what's the ground by which i mean in the in ancient rhetorical tradition they would call it the common places or toe point common places are more associated with audiences like what do audiences bring with them? So imagine a soccer game where audiences bring part of the pitch with them and start putting it out and it expands 
one person's amount of things they have to defend or it may or they like start to reconstruct the goal and the goal gets wider and easier to shoot on it's like oh my gosh we're gonna have to adapt to what the audience brought so that's commonplace it's we'll table that for now but the idea of ground I mean, there's like, even uh i don't know if it's a fallacy it's not it doesn't sound like a fallacy um it sort of is um but but goes in there the mo moving goalposts right yeah moving goalposts yeah. that's that's yeah. something that we can definitely give our audience tools to to deal with because you know i always i mean it's easy i can make a couple sentences yeah that's really interesting i'd love to have that argument with you. but let's that's a separate argument let's handle this one which reminding you is this yeah, no, uh, moving thing. moving gold so that's 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 kind of breaking uh, breaking it into little manageable pieces right but there's mm -hmm. there's there's the so-called uh i guess they call the logical fallacy of moving the, the goal posts no yeah I, I know yeah i know it's like yeah. it's when it's when they say well i accomplished this so i win but it's like no, no i accomplished this so i win and it's like you can't ever tell exactly when it is when you've uh made your when they've made their point like okay what are you trying i to think do? i think moving a goal post is when you you keep being proved wrong and you say oh I, that that's not what i was saying i was right, saying yeah, yeah. so like like a yeah. common one would be the the, the world is going to end you know april 12th and it doesn't end april 12th it's no no no, no. uh i read the thing true. wrong it was it's it's you know um that's a literal kind of keep changing their their argument but a lot of times they'll do that where they they keep losing, yeah. but won't just say, okay, okay, I was wrong, though. So right. I don't know what I was trying oh, to yeah. say. Was this See, thing. yeah, your articulation of it just sounds like argument writ large. Like, people are still writing books about Bentham and Bentham's philosophy, and that there's, like, much more out there about why, you know, the Benthamites are not quite right. You know, this is never ending. I think I always thought of moving right. goalposts as being like, right. we've agreed to debate this, or argue this, and here's what we're trying to determine. And they keep saying, well, I've won because I determined this. I'm like, yeah, but five minutes ago, you said that you would be satisfied if you determined this. Yeah, yeah that's, and I, that's the way I understand. Okay. But I see what you, yeah. I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, but to me, that I, just sounds like a healthy democratic system where people are always trying to defend their points, and people are like, "Ah, you're nuts." Maybe yeah, we need to. Yeah, we also need to talk about that there are appropriate times to move the goalposts when it's like you, you two, you had a mis interpretation, or the person even through the discussion realized that honestly that that's not what they kind of what they agreed to earlier really wasn't what they meant. This is my favorite kind of argument is when everyone goes, what are we, what are we talking about? <laughs> and then you have to reset. Maybe that's the a title. What are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what I want to have happen. It's like, wait, what was that? What was my position? And what was yours? Do we know enough about this? Right. Yeah. I mean, a nice goal of the whole thing would be just everyone having a little bit more intellectual humility. Right. Yeah. Um, that is a good goal for the podcast. I'll say I mean, good arguments always make you feel kind of dumb, right? Yeah. We're uh, running out of time. I don't want to take up too many of time. Um, I wanted to see, well, I guess first of all, it'd be good to do a sanity check. Is this something we all still kind of want to pursue? I would want to see how it goes, right? Um, I, I don't know. I want, I want to try out some of these things and see if there's any it's kind of like you got to have the right flow and chemistry for it to actually even work. So I want to see if it works. Um, and we could try the different um, approaches a few times and see if any of them kind of mm -hmm. stick. Yeah, I'm not even going to, I don't even think we should pick a name until we get five episodes in. Um, and then, no, I'm not going to build websites or logos, even though that's, you know, that's what I do when I get an idea. First, I buy a domain. <laughs> right, of course. How else would you start? I don't know right, how else we would right. start. And that's why I have the domain argument autopsy, which is very much this idea, sort of. Um, and we could use that if we want to, even as a temporary placeholder. Um, and we all wear white coats and pockets. Yeah, right. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so if everyone's still kind of smiling. Um, yeah, I think it's good. One, one of the things I'd say, I, I agree with Tim, we have to see how it goes in the chemistry and everything. One, mm -hmm. one thing I, I think would help a lot from having done a bunch of different podcasts is if we all have kind of like assignments to do, like parts that we're responsible for. So that way the flow of the podcast is like, okay, so let's, and now we'll go for this one, we go to Steve, we we'll go to Tim, and then you give your two or three minute take that you've kind of pre-prepared. Um, and that, that's something that I would want to see. Um, there's some kind of like, people take a bit and then they're responsible for that. It makes the flow a lot better because uh, people can say, oh yeah, that's interesting. Let's do this. 
for now, do we mind quickly scheduling our next meeting? We could we could either try that or just discuss more. I'm fine with either, but I I realized I overlapped this with an optional meeting of mine, so I would like to move it an hour and a half later. Does that not work for anyone? I don't know, Adriel. None of this. Yeah, that doesn't great. work for for me. I have a hard stop in three minutes. And that's uh, yeah. I, it it, it works for me, except that like the meeting I ha I have a half hour meeting or a fifteen minute meeting that starts in two minutes, and it usually takes forty five minutes. So <laughs> that's that's where I'm not sure it works for me. I'm the easiest so try person. It. I'm the easiest person until September. Yeah. But I think I'll know we'll my know. teaching schedule in the week, and I can I can email it out, and then we'll see if it. I don't think it'll cause any trouble because all uh, the parents take the morning classes. So yeah. Now for Adriel, for Adriel, it's easiest nights and weekends. Um, Tim, you you don't do weekends though, right? I try not to. Yeah, and I mean, we could do a one-off weekend, but I wouldn't want it to be a regular right, right, right. thing. Yeah. I can do nights. I'm fine with that. Uh, nights, weekdays. My only problem with yeah. nights is nights are later for me. I think I'm I'm an hour ahead of Eastern. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, like, an Adriel, you're. Actually yeah, I'm going. Pacific. So I, I mean, for me, nights would. You know, I I, I guess I could do like five although that might be iffy sometimes so i mean ideally I'd probably shoot for six which would then be 10 for tim so that's pretty getting pretty late yeah family family things get in the way yeah family you said something about setting up a slack or some other kind of yeah might, you know let's that might that. be an asynchronous solution where we could is everyone okay this, with that kind of conversation is everyone okay with slack because i might just use a a, a place in our canonical debate lab slack would be easiest for me to set up so so you already have a channel, right? Slack. We have a channel for a podcast. Yeah. Yeah. So, Adriel, you're, you're going to do. Slack. I'm, yeah, I mean, I, I'm here trying it. I've never tried Slack outside of like a work environment where I just have the single Slack at a time that follows whoever I'm working for at that moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can try it out. So, yeah, I'll make one on CDL until this thing solidifies a bit more and then let's chat on schedules i mean i could I, we could if we want to try just one more week at this time uh we could do that and um uh because i can miss that other meeting it's not a big deal um okay. I, and then I'll, i'm good with that yeah but be thinking about schedule and steve yeah when you have your uh, class schedule let us know okay it'll be afternoons i mean okay the parents take the mornings and always outvoted take care <laughs> cool well i'm gonna start stop recording